This video is sponsored by EcoFlow. There'll be more on that later. They got both versions of the mm, grill. This is the griddle, which gives you a solid surface. Stainless steel thing is uh, built like a tank. And uh, that's the uh, that's the grilling surface. So if you got uh, burgers, you can either griddle them or you can grill them. This is actually good for bacon and uh, pancakes and uh, anything that you don't want falling through the cracks. And this one is good for anything else. Steaks or hamburgers or, you know, pork chops or anything like that sausages and uh so those are the those are the uh adjustable height stakes so we're gonna have to make some sort of thing that's going to hold these guys in the upright position because there's little grooves on these things that allows you to adjust your cooking height so that's how you adjust your heat on your fire well good morning guys welcome to another fine day at the off grid it's a beautiful day today you know we're into midsummer and uh, we've had a little bit of chance to use our island and uh, now we got uh, we got some other issues we got to contend to this is part of the bigger plan that we've had is the uh, the outdoor kitchen so we got our kitchen sink and uh, now we need to complete our work triangle by work triangle I mean a cooking surface so that's my plan today is build a, a permanent location for my mm, grill and it's going to be right about here and I'm thinking kind of like a circular gabion basket sort of thing that's going to uh, bring us up to kind of stove height because if anybody's ever camped knows that cooking on a campfire kind of isn't the best thing because you're crouched down you've got smoke in the face because you're you know you got your fire going so what my plan is to, is to raise it up, bring it up to, you know, comfort height. So Don, you got any idea what the plan is today? I have a rough idea. A rough idea, yeah. It's always a fun game of trying to get what's in my head and convey it to Don so we both on the same page to build what we're going to build. So what, what we're going to build a circle, a circle with a rectangle. Cir yes. Yeah. A, a circle with a rectangle made out of rocks. That's right, like a gabion basket, yeah. circular, with a uh, a rectangular insert. Stove, sink, fridge, stove, sink, fridge, and it goes in a triangle fashion because it's the most efficient way to cook. That's right. So the rectangular insert is designed to hold the coals from blowing away on top of the circle. That's right. So what's what's a stove? What's the height of a stove? Thirty inches. No, it's got to be higher than that. What's countertop? Countertop 36? 32? 32? We'll have to Google that. Okay, so this is our area that I want to be dealing with. So this is the size of the mm, grill. Uh, but I want the base to be larger than this. And I want it up higher. So kind of got a blank slate. We can kind of decide what we want to do with the space that we have. I'll probably cut in a little bit to the deck. Maybe as much as over there, just to kind of give it a nice kind of nice round shape so you can walk right up to it without being in the mud. Gets us close enough to our uh, kitchen sink because again, the work triangle when you're dealing with kitchens and, and building kitchens. <laughs> Alright, to bring you guys up to speed, we've leveled and plumbed our mesh basket. Now this is the rough footprint of our cooking surface. So the idea is to fill this all the way up to the top and then add clay at the end of it. And that gives us our, our first level and then we built kind of like a box around it. So all we got to do now is place the rocks gently in the basket. Now we did a different kind of gabion basket where you could just kind of throw them in. This one's not going to lend itself that well to that. So we're going to kind of stack the stones carefully just to make sure it doesn't deform our basket. All right, we've got to figure out a solution to this problem. So the grill that we're using is the mm grill and it comes with these stainless steel stakes. And the idea behind these guys is to stick them in the ground. But much like my shop floor, 
it ain't gonna stick in the ground. So the plan is to make a bracket that is going to hold these uprights and allow me to use the grill to its full potential, meaning it'll be able to slide up and down. And then this peg will be in the vertical position to hold my grill. So I'm thinking something like a steel pin like this that sits inside this guy, maybe this way, like this. So it allows me to, I don't wanna get that stuck on there. It allows me to keep it upright, but then have a bracket so it'll maintain the weight. And then I'm gonna embed it in concrete and uh, that's going to hold my grill in place. So that's, that's my plan. I just gotta weld up a bracket. Oh, yeah, so some, some square tubing and some spare parts. Shouldn't be too hard. world test of the bracket system to hold up the Uzi You guys can see that real closely. I'm not a great welder. I, uh, I can't give you any tips other than just keep practicing. That's what I did. I was like, I want to weld things. So I went and bought a welder and I started sticking things together. The best describe my welding ability as glue gunning stuff. And uh, you know what? Paint fixes what a welder you ain't. Anyway, this should hold up, not to mention it's going to be encased in concrete. So uh, let's do a real world test on this thing. So the idea behind this thing, if you guys can see this right there, is, is these pegs are sitting inside there. I may cut these off at a later date. So the plan, if I cut them off, make them a little shorter so I don't have to encase these so much concrete. So that's, that's the system there. And then you take that grill and you put it on top there, just like that. And you'll be able to adjust the height of the grill just like that. Now, I don't know if I want to try this. So the idea is it, it won't, can't pivot forward at all because it's kind of cantilevered out the bottom. And uh, let's try this. So I don't know what you guys grill at home, but you should be able to, that's pretty good. You should be able to probably grill at least 150 pounds of wildebeest or whatever. So that's, that's solid. I'm pretty confident that that weld is not going to break when I cook my sausages and hamburgers. So there you go. And then that's what's cool about it. Now it could be on a solid surface. That's pretty nifty. If you're wondering why I'm wearing an apron, is because of that unfortunate catching fire incident way back in 06. This, I've had this for a while and it's made of canvas and uh, my sister-in-law made it for me. I'm not sure why. Maybe she doesn't want me to catch fire. I don't know, but she makes these things. It uh, originally was designed as a kind of dust keeper offer when I was working in the shop to, uh, to prevent dust from, from accumulating on me, but it, uh, it seems to be fireproof too which is cool. So that's kind of neat. Looks like I'm wearing a dress. Look, it's got the, it's got, I got an A-frame dress on. Look at that. <laughs> I like it.
This video is sponsored by EcoFlow Power Kits. EcoFlow Power Kits are the first compact modular systems for tiny homes and RVs. With a plug and play design, it's easier than ever to customize the power needs that you require. Did I mention it's scalable? You can go from two kilowatts all the way up to 15 kilowatts. So that makes it really easy to size your system according to the power usage that you need. For my needs here in the cube, I picked a four kilowatt system. So I'm gonna show you just how easy it is using the EcoFlow's power kits to install power in your off-grid tiny home, RV, or even a boat. Okay, now that I got this system installed, I'll give you guys a little bit of a tour. Now, I am very impressed with this system. Not every day does a piece of technology wow me. This thing is really cool. So it's EcoFlow Power Hub. This is the box. This is the main box that everything connects to. So what's really neat about this thing is that you can connect all of your solar off-grid devices. So I have in the uh, in the first port, it's my uh, photovoltaic cells or my solar panels. So I've got a 200 watt panels on the uh, vertical surface. I don't have them horizontal and I wanna catch my morning sun because that's the best sun I get around here. I don't get a lot of overhead sun because of a lot of the trees. Uh, in future, maybe in the winter time and I want some horizontal panels, I can add them because I got three ports for solar panels. So one, two, three, and then the next ports that I have are the battery connectors, which is uh, battery one, battery two, battery three. You can hook up to 15 kilowatts of power to this thing in many different configuration. I currently have two kilowatt batteries. So I have two, two kilowatt batteries. So that gives me a total of four kilowatts on this particular system. And then you can hook up if you have a EcoFlow smart generator, which is a gas power generator to top the system up, say, uh, you know, it's cloudy for six weeks and you run out of power. You can hook up a the EcoFlow smart generator to this port. Also, you can, if you are installing this in an RV or something that is portable, you can have shore power plugged into this port over here, which is the AC in port, which will charge your system. So if you have like a camper van or an RV or something like that, you can plug it into shore power. And on the pack itself, it has an AC out, which is a 20 amp port, which allows you to plug in uh, any devices. So this is how I have the cube running is actually the AC out port I have plugged into the actual cube. So that's what's powering the cube. So there's a couple ways of turning this system on. Well, there's a button here and that turns the whole system on. And then up here, there is hardwired button. So you don't need this control panel, but this is where it's really cool. This is the control panel. So you can actually control the entire system. It gives you the statistics on the system. It says uh, currently the batteries are charged up to 32%. Available time in the current running capacity is 99 days, 23 hours. So that's just kind of an idle mode. It's currently overcast. It's about ready to rain. Uh, we have a solar input of 12 watts, which is decent considering they're mounted vertically and not horizontally and output of zero watts. Now the touch screen here, I can hit the AC button and what it does is it actually controls the power hub. Hello, AC power hub. AC output. Oh, I have to slide it. I only touched it. So there you go. We've got AC is turned on. The cube is powered up. It shows output of 59 watts and it shows that it'll run it for about 13 hours in this configuration with all the lights on, which is kind of cool. And then there's all sorts of other things. You got the settings, you've got uh, your screen timeout. You can, you can turn this thing on and off this way. It's really neat. What I didn't mention about these lithium iron phosphate batteries is they're good for low temperature. They have a heating element inside of them to operate at low temperatures. They'll go down to minus two Fahrenheit or minus 20 Celsius. So it's great for off-grid applications. EcoFlow has truly thought of everything with this power hub. On the side of it, it's got DC out. So 13.6 volts to 26.4 volts out. That's DC, or you also have your AC out, which is Convenient if you have an RV and you've got them both sets. You've got the DC for lighting and you got your AC for all your appliances. This is where the AC DC smart distribution panel comes into play. So it's another add-on which I'm not going to be using in the queue because I don't I don't need it. But it is a really cool option to have. So what you would do is you would plug in this cord here to the power hub and then you connect this essentially distribution hub and it allows you to power all of your AC devices and your DC devices simultaneously. And it's got all the quick connections and the fuses and the breakers and everything you need. It's plug and play. 
and it's a la carte. So you just kind of buy what you need to outfit your, your RV or your tiny home. And what's really cool about this guy is you can actually recess it in the wall. So you don't actually have to have it. It, it fits like seamlessly in any kind of design you can think of. It's, it's, this thing is really slick. The other really neat feature with the EcoFlow Power Hub is the app. You can download an app to your phone and you can control the Power Hub from your phone. Say you leave and you think maybe I left the lights on and it's draining my batteries. Well, you can check it on your phone. It gives you all that information and you can remotely turn it off from your phone or for that matter, you can turn it on from your phone. So if you, you know, you're coming home late and you want the lights turned on, you can turn it on from your phone, which is really neat. EcoFlow has been a big supporter of my channel. So if you guys are looking for off-grid power or portable power, I highly recommend you checking them out at ecoflow.com to check out their power packs, or you can click the link down in the description below. Thanks, EcoFlow. Well, hello up there. My original plan was to take this thing that I made, I fabbed it up at the shop, and to bury it in concrete. So it was just these little pegs sticking out so I could have my thing sitting inside. And then I thought to myself, I don't know if I should do that. So I've kind of done a redesign midway, such as life, just kind of evolving as we're going. So the plan now is to make somewhat of a concrete pad here and then have this as a bracket that sits here. And then what I'm gonna do is actually make a pan that slides in here for my ash tray. And then when I can take my ashes out and throw them away, I don't have to clean anymore. And it's uh, it kind of like it's multi-purpose. Say if you, know, you need to move the bracket, you can always just take the bracket out and, uh, and use it somewhere else, which is kind of cool, multi-purpose. So that's, that's, my, that's my thoughts right now. So uh, what I gotta do is form a box. I'm gonna pour a concrete sign with a sidewalk here, and it's going to uh, sit a nice level spot for this bracket. I think that'll look good. What do you guys think? It's daunting. When you're thinking, gotta pour concrete. And you never buy enough concrete. I bought two bags. Hopefully it'll do it. Anyways, all right, let's get started. Uh, I'm gonna form this guy up and uh, curb front. Should be easy. Pour it now. Trowel it out all afternoon. Something nice, relaxing to do. Now that I've gotten this far, I kind of want to change my mind again. I think I'm going to embed the posts into the rock because I think it'll take away from this area here. So this will be my concrete flat spot and then I'll have the two pegs just sticking up. It'll keep it clean and simple. I think it'll look better in the long run. This guy. I was always told that uh, if you mix concrete really dry, it's stronger. I don't know if that's true or not, or if it's just a cruel way to get a young person to work harder. I know it's harder to trowel out dry concrete, but if it's soupy, maybe there's some, maybe there's some truth to that. Maybe dry, dry mixed concrete is stronger. Makes you stronger anyways, because you have to work harder to trowel it. Here's hoping, here's hoping it's stronger. So the plan is to uh, coat this, let it set up, and then uh, go to the next step. I got that concrete pretty smooth considering how dry it was. Generally speaking, when you're ever you're doing concrete, and I am by no means an expert at doing concrete, you trowel it out the best you can and you let it sit. And what happens is the water seems to float up to the surface. And then once that water disappears, you can trowel it out again and get that kind of glassy finish. From my experience anyways, I'm sure there's people that are way better at concrete that can explain it way better than I can, but this is how I do it. This is, uh, this is gonna be the base of the, uh, the cooktop. So the fire is actually gonna go right here, and then the cooker's gonna, the, the grill is gonna go up here, and uh, everything's gonna be cool. But I still gotta build the sides on this thing. So this is first step, and then I build the sides on it, 
and uh, probably an air vent or some sort of fresh air intake on the side so you don't get smoke in the face. It's always a little nerve wracking taking the forms off your newly poured concrete. But in this case, I was careful to tap all the way around the forms. So all my concrete worked down to the bottom. So I was pretty confident taking the forms off that I'd, I would be pretty good. It's kind of like baking a cake and then you flip it over and then you see your cake has got no air bubbles or any kind of, uh, you know, imperfections or voids. That's the same idea when you're doing anything with concrete is you want to Make sure you force all your concrete down the sides in order to uh, get yourself a perfect form. And in this case, I was really concerned about the front, not so much about the sides because the sides were going to be covered. In order to get enough material to make our fire pit, we first ended up collecting a bunch of stones and then we ended up cleaning them using a what looked like a large toothbrush type device. And we scrubbed all the clay that was stuck to it in order to give our mortar something really solid to stick onto. added the stones to the barbecue kind of equal parts stone equal parts mortar we built it up layer by layer we started with the bottom and then we after the first layer we ended up putting a air charge tube in the base of it to allow our fire to have enough oxygen to kind of burn a little cleaner and have less smoke on our face we loosely placed the mortar knowing that we would come back later and uh, tool it out with either a glove or a brush once it's kind of partially dry whenever you're using kind of like a rubble foundation type build, it's really difficult to actually lay it like bricks. So it's kind of a messy process in order to get it right. But once the stuff firms up a bit, it's a lot easier to tool. So like I said, once it's dry, we'll go back and we will tool it using either like a leather glove or even a uh, like a plastic bristle brush to tool out the thing. And if there's any spots where we don't have enough mortar, we can always add more mortar later. And the same goes for the height of our backstop. We can always add more rock if we find once we use the cooktop. If we need more focused heat, we can always go higher at a later date. You see it kind of like sag in there? So once that dries up, you'll be able to push it in and it'll stay up there. Same goes for here. And then what you'll do is you'll take a, a brush and kind of brush that out and it'll give you a nice finish. It's kind of fiddly, but you know, so there's our air charge tube. Allows us oxygen. You can see right, can you see through it? Yeah, you can see through it. I promise you can see through it. Anyway, so that's that'll be allow, allow us to uh, have enough air for our fire once we get it down here. And then this will be the base for our fire. I may make a metal pan to hold all my ash and then I can just take the pan out and then it's, it's just clean. And then there's my uh, my metal brackets for the uh, grill stands. Well, that was pretty cool. The uh, the elusive blue heron actually made a, a pit stop on top of that uh, balsam tree and then he just uh, left. But uh, I'm sure he was trying to look for lunch. Speaking of lunch, so are we. I've got my buddy Mike here and he self-proclaimed? So, uh, amateur. Amateur. amateur he, yeah. He's a professional cook. No, he's not. A, a professional amateur. That's right. Well, yeah. you got an Italian background. So everybody yeah. with an Italian background knows how to cook, right? Yes, and uh, lay bricks. In lay bricks. <laughs> <laughs> so the plan today is to give our, our our cooking station a run for its money. It's our first initial test. We don't exactly know how it's going to work. Okay. And then when you th whenever it involves food, right? Mike Mike's involved because you, I, I, I you have like, to like food, right? Got to keep up the physique. It is it is lunchtime, so we're gonna just I got to do a little couple more dusting off of the surface of the the cooking area and install my uh, my mm, grill side supports and then Mike you're going to show us how to make the ultimate cheeseburger. We're going to have a little cooking with Mike. That's right. That's going to be like is it like what's what's the other famous Italian cooking lady Giardia? Uh, what's her not Giardia. 
Jeez, I don't know. Gia De La Renta. I don't know her name. Guy Fieri. No, well, I Guy. The hair. Guy Fieri, <laughs> yes, but there, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of the other one. The the one the Bruschetto. What, what's her name? Uh, I can't remember her name. I can't remember. We gotta look her up because we'll she's. Up. We'll Google it. She's something. Anyways, okay, so we're gonna cook. We're gonna dust this thing off. We're gonna give it. It's a maiden voyage, and uh, we're gonna see. We're gonna either. We're gonna either. Well, cooking and fire. I've got a track record. So does it work too good or what? What's going on here? There's a lot of heat pouring off of this thing. So do you think it maybe uh, maybe we put too much wood in there? No. We got just enough. We got a nice coal base and then we can start cooking. Yeah. That's great. It's a pretty good coal base there. A nice fire. Well, she's got a nice she got a nice burn, right? She's got no smoke. Very nope. little smoke. Smokeless. Smokeless. Smokeless fire pit, homemade. It's pretty good. I like it. It's nice, nice height too. It is perfect height for cooking. Give you guys a little bit of a pond update. I know you guys were very concerned about the fish the other day when we started doing some uh, some remediation. It seems like the fish have uh, they're still doing excellent. We've only ever found uh, I think three dead fish, so uh, they've been they've been doing okay ever since we put the aluminum sulfate in. Uh, the water seems to be cleared up. The fish are feeding as normal. As you can see, uh, we just fed them and you can see them actually feeding there, which is, uh, which is good. So the pond is, is, is doing okay. Again, we still, have to, we still have to, you know, add more rocks around the perimeter just to kind of keep them clear. But I believe over time, once the vegetation establishes, it should, uh, it should be working better than that. I actually picked up a, a new little thing here. Uh, I haven't quite set it up yet, but uh, I've got a deer feeder from uh, Cabela's Bass Pro Shops, and uh, I'm gonna rig that thing up at some time in a later date to actually feed my fish, because I'm not down here every day, and uh, I think I should probably feed them every day. Although, in the summertime, they tend to slow down their feeding because it's just, it's just warm out. So this guy here, I should be able to rig it up. Easy set programmable digital timer. So you can you can set a feeding time every day to sprinkle. It'll shoot food over the entire pond area. So make sure my fish get really nice and big. I'd go, lower, I'd go lower than that, like right down. Do you want to go right there? Right there? Yeah. That's probably good. Tom, what do you think so far? Looks like it's it's setting up pretty good, right? Yeah, it looks great. Looks very professional. I think it's great. So we're doing half and half? Half and half, half pork, half medium ground beef. Nice. And then you got uh, a bit of garlic. Garlic? Yeah, garlic powder. We'll do uh, salt and pepper. Actually, let's do a little bit more garlic. We got the parmesan. Parmesan. Eh? There we go. Salty is salty. Yes, it comes out of its face. It comes out. That's disturbing. That's why they're at the <laughs> off-grid. <dude. laughs> Cracking at the bottom. What a life. Okay, yeah, let's get the bottom open. Uh, you need some more pepper? There you go. There we go. There we go. Out at the bottom. Uh, there we go. There we go. That's what we're talking there. about. There. You want to talk about room temperature meat while you're making that? Yes. So one mistake people often make when making burgers is using cold meat. When you're using cold meat, it's not good for your hands because you're adding all the extra heat from your hands into there and it doesn't cook right, I find. Now, I could be wrong, I am no expert, but in my experience, using room temperature meat and a good blend of beef and pork, you get a nice juicy burger every single time. Then you want some bacon? You gonna, you're gonna taste it or you're just gonna inhale it? Take a bite, take a bite, take a bite. Bite, bite. There you go. Yes, you don't have it's tasty. Mmm, bacon. Oh, is that good, buddy? Yeah. Good buddy. Don, how, how does it feel watching somebody else do all the work? It's great. Mike's the star of the show. Isn't it great? Yeah. yeah. He obviously knows what he's doing. That's right. We're it's just perfect. Keep too many cooks in the kitchen is a bad That's thing, right. right? Yeah. No, I'm just here. Uh, Taking it all in, maybe I'll learn something.
What do you think of that? Is that bush flipper we got there? Hey, it works. Doesn't it work great? Look at that. Perfect size for the burger. Let's see how this is going to go. Oh, yeah. Oh. And then this honking burger. Massive one. Look at that perfect fit. Crazy hamburger. Take a diner's burger, buddy. Oh wow! What are you guys gonna have? <laughs> we got a <laughs> that thing. We're gonna check back with you, see how, how you make out on that one. Okay. Is there uh, some prize at the end? If you can finish that burger, I will. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the prize of indigestion, I think. Yeah. Give, give her a whirl. The, give me all the and acid that I can take. There you go. Eat off the other side, bean. Good, eh? Mmm. <laughs> I've got the reasonable size burger. Look at this. Look at that burger. Mm. That. It's got the bacon. It's got the cheese. I got the mustard, which that's what I like. Is I like only mustard on my burger, and I might be odd for that. We got some sweet potato fries. I got our side of Pringles, because I like Pringles, barbecue Pringles. What do you got? You got? What do you got in yours? Sweet potato fries. Got the burger with some red onion, bacon, cheese, ketchup, and mustard. Nice. Mm. I haven't, I haven't tried it yet. Let's just go. Bean wants to try it for me. Bean, can, can you, you want this? Doesn't that look good? Mm. Look at that. Fresh bun. The bun to burger ratio is where it's at. Look at that. It is good. That's like, a good ratio. It's good ratio. It's got, it can't be too big. It can't, it can't have too much meat. I should just take a bite. Stop talking, Kevin. You eat your burger. Hmm. <laughs> Dude. Forest burger. Dude. Ultimate cheeseburger. That is that is good. Mm. Tip of the hat to the cook. That was good. Thank you, sir. You've lived up to your Italian heritage. It's in there somewhere. So I don't cook a lot, as you guys may know. As a person that cooks a lot, Mike, what do you think? Of the height of that grill it's perfect height for cooking because you're not leaning down and you're not going too high and it's enough away from your face it doesn't burn and it's uh the wind guard at the back is perfect for the wind where it's blowing i think you did a fantastic job All it right. turned out really well well on that note we're gonna finish our burgers has put a chip down because she thinks she can get burger She'll eat the chip later. Anyways, on that note, I'm gonna continue eating my burger.